This is a public park, they would say. You can't occupy it like this, so you have to find somewhere appropriate to bring about the fulfillment of a place. The fulfillment of an audience. Finally, there must be people who come to listen. If there's no audience for the sutra lecture, you can go ahead and lecture to the tables and chairs, but can they listen? No, the audience is necessary. For the Suragama Sutra, the place is the Chetta Grove in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary and the city of Shravasti, where the Buddha dwelt in his disciples in his disciples. Where the Buddha dwelt with his disciples. In this sutra, the audience is composed of the great bishops and bodhisattvas who came to listen. When Ananda says, "Thus I have heard," the "I" refers to the hypothetical self of the bodhisattva. There are four kinds of self. Ordinary people have an attachment to the self, which comes from their attachment to the body. Non-Buddhist religions speak of a divine self. They maintain that there is a Godhead and say that they themselves are God. Bodhisattvas follow worldly custom and manifest a hypothetical self. The Buddha have the true self of the body, of the Dharma body. The ordinary person is attached to his body and feels that it is his real self. Actually, the body is but a temporary dwelling, like a hotel. You can live in a hotel for a while, but eventually you will have to move. You can't stay forever. Ordinary people do not understand this principle. They think my body is me, and they strive to feed it well and dress it beautifully. They Look for pleasure to indulge it in. They want an elegant home and beautiful surroundings. They busy themselves dressing well, eating rich food, and living high, all only to have out their stinking skin bags. The human body is merely a stinking skin bag. You don't believe it? Take a look. Unclean matter oozes from your eyes. Your ears discharge wax. Which is also unclean. Your nose is full of filthy mucus, and your mouth is full of unclean saliva and phlegm. If you don't bathe for four days, your body begins to sink, and if you perspire, it becomes full, full in just a day or two. Faces and urine are also filthy. Impurities are constantly being discharged from the nine. Bodily apertures of the eyes, ears, nostrils, mouth, anus, and urethra. They are all unclean. What is there to love about your body? You may dress it in finery, dab it with perfume, slay for it for all day, applying lipsticks, rouge, and powder, as some women. Are one to do, all for the sake of the false shell of the body. No matter how good the food, it still turns into excrement. Decorating the body just like decorating a toilet with beautiful material. No matter how elegant the toilet turns out, it is still a place to deposit filthy things. Would you say the insides of a human body are clean? Tell me, what's so good about your body? When the time comes to die, it retains no sentiment for you. It doesn't say you've been so good to me. I live a few extra days and help you out. It can't do it. So what good is the body after all? Nonetheless, the ordinary person is attached to his body and takes it as himself. This is my body, he says. You hit me. I can't allow that. How dare you insult me? Ultimately, who is that me? He doesn't even know who he is. Who he is, and yet he says others are insulting him or hitting him. He hasn't recognized his original face and thinks the flesh body is me. The spirit and the self nature are the true self, but he has not 
felt them. He can't see them. He doesn't even know enough to look for them. He just assumes he's doing the right thing by slaving for the sake of his body. If your primary concern is to get the better half of things for yourself, you haven't figured out life right. Anyone like that won't be able to make things add up. He's busy for the sake of himself to the exclusion of all else. Therefore, Bodhisattva is never busy for himself. He's busy for the sake of others. If people want his help, his help, he will give it to them regardless of the circumstances. Non-Buddhist religions speak of a divine self. What is the self? They say it is God. There are many varieties of this kind of self, but they will not be discussed at this time. What is the hypothetical self of the Bodhisattva? Ananda says, first I have heard. However, Ananda is enlightened. At the time he recalls the Buddha's words for us, he has already attained a hardship, and so he no longer has any eye, any ego. And saying, in saying, I have heard, he is simply following worldly custom and assuming a hypothetical self in order to be comprehensible to ordinary people who have an attachment to the self. Bodhisattvas do not have the characteristic of a self. They recognize the ordinary attachment to the self as false and they seek the true self of one's own nature. It is from the false self that you can arrive at the true self. For only if you recognize the false can you find the true. If you don't recognize the false as false, how can you find the truth? Why are we now investigating the Buddha Dharma? It is because we are searching for true principle. Why do we seek true principle? Because we know that everything in the world is false and we want to find the truth within falsity. What is the true self of one's own nature that the Bodhisattva seeks? It is the Buddha. The Buddha is the true self. Before you have realized Buddhahood, your eye is false. The Bodhisattva knows the self is false, but the ordinary person says, You say the self is false, but as I see it, my body is excellent. It is strong, tall, well proportioned, and handsome. You may say it is false, but I think it is true. He can't see through it, and so he can't put it down. Unable to put it down, he cannot become truly independent. The phrase I have heard indicates the fulfillment of hearing. Now, basically, you may say the ears hear. Why doesn't it say, thus the ears heard? Instead of, thus I have heard, actually the ears cannot hear. They are merely the organ of hearing. What hears is the nature which is eternally present. It is the mind that heard. What it heard was the Dharma which is thus. Which Dharma is thus, you ask? It is the Suragama Sutra that Dharma Master Paramiti wrote out on sheer silk, placed in an incision he made in his arm, carried to China and translated into Chinese. Now it has come to America, where it has been translated into English. It is what Ananda himself heard the Buddha speak. It is what the Buddha has transmitted to China. It is not something that Ananda as an individual put together and made. It is the drama the Buddha spoke. All sutras that the Buddha spoke begin with the four words, thus I have heard. There are four reasons for that. After the Buddha had entered Nirvana and it came time to compile the sutras, another ascended the high seat to speak drama. He immediately manifested the appearance of entering Samadhi and sat there for perhaps five minutes without speaking. Once he had entered Samadhi, his appearance became identically with the Buddha's. He was endowed with the 32 marks and 80 subtle characteristics of a Buddha. 
He emitted light and moved the earth. The great assembly of disciples immediately gave rise to three doubts. One, some thought that Shakyamuni Buddha had come back to life because they saw that Ananda had taken all the perfect features of the Buddha. The disciples had probably been thinking so much about the Buddha that their brains were a bit murky, and so they jumped into this conclusion. Two, some thought that the reason Ananda now had such perfect features was that he, Ananda, had himself realized Buddhahood. Three, some thought a Buddha had come from another region. It isn't Shakyamuni Buddha and Ananda hasn't come, hasn't become a Buddha, they thought. Perhaps it is a Buddha from the north, south, east, and west, from one of the ten directions. But as soon as Ananda said, first I have heard, the three doubts of the assembly were sudden resolved. When the Buddha was about to enter Nirvana, he announced his intent to his disciples and they began to cry. Ananda, who was the Buddha's cousin, cried the hardest of all them. Of them all. He sobbed and wept properly until his tears washed his face clean. Finally, the venerable Aniruddha approached him and said, Don't cry. You can't cry. Since the Buddha is about to enter Nirvana, you should ask him what to do about things after he is gone. What things should I ask about? Ananda said. The venerable Aniruddha replied, In the future the sutras will be compiled. You should ask what was to begin them with. Second, Aniruddha continued, When the Buddha is in the world, we live with the Buddha. When the Buddha enters Nirvana, where will we dwell? Ask the Buddha that. Third, we now rely on the Buddha as our teacher. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, whom should we take as our teacher? We have to have a teaching and transforming guide, a teaching host, fourth, when the Buddha is in the world, he is able to discipline and subdue the bad nature of shoes. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, how should they be dealt with? The proper thing for you to go, for you to do is to go ask the Buddha these four questions. Ananda agreed. He went to the Buddha and asked, When the Buddha is in the world, we take the Buddha as our master. After the Buddha enters Nirvana, whom should we take as master? The Buddha answered, Take the precepts as your master. Bhikshus and Bhikshunis should take the precepts as master. When the Buddha is in the world, we dwell with the Buddha, Ananda said. When the Buddha enters Nirvana, where shall we dwell? When the Buddha leaves the world, we, you should dwell in the four applications of mindfulness. The Buddha answered, the four applications of mindfulness are contemplate the body as impure, contemplate feelings as suffering, contemplate the thoughts as impermanent, and contemplate dramas as being without self. If you contemplate the body as impure, you won't love the body. If you contemplate feelings as suffering, you can't be greedy for pleasure. If you know thoughts are impermanent, you won't become attached to the polluted thoughts that arise in your mind. The dramas that are without a self are the five skandhas or heaps, form, feeling, thinking, activity, and consciousness. Third, Ananda said, In the future, when the sutras are compiled, what was should we begin with them with? The Buddha answered, Use these four words, those I have heard. These words and the six fulfillments represent the completeness of the sutra's meaning and certify that the sutra was spoken by the Buddha. I have just one more question, said Ananda. When the Buddha is in the world, he can control the bad natured pictures. But when the Buddha enters Nirvana, what is to be done about them? The Buddha said, As to the bad natured pictures, Ignore them and they will go away. Pay no attention to them. Don't talk to them. Don't sit with them. In general, treat them as the 
despicable. Ignore them. If no one pays any attention to them, they won't be able to do anything, no matter how evil they may be. Bad-natured visuals are people who have left the home life and who say and do unprincipled things. When the Buddha was in the world, there were six visuals who were very bad. You shouldn't think that every person who lives a home life is good. There are also many unruly people among the Sangha. The Buddha instructs us to ignore them and they will go away, keep silent and pay no attention to them. In that way, you can subdue them.